Now, before we get into the meat of today's discussion, we thought it might be useful to introduce a few key terms that will come up through the session and that may not be familiar to everybody. So data marginalization refers to the processes through which marginalized and underrepresented voices are hidden due to inadequate data collection. It can occur due to populations being invisible in mainstream societies and limitations in interacting with data collectors due to inaccessible and rigid means of collection. This results in a lack of reliable data and leads to further entrenchment and marginalization, margin, further entrenching, excuse me, marginalization, marginalization, exclusion. Disaggregated data refers to data that can be separated into smaller parts for the purposes of analyzing trends and providing better insights. And it's necessary, for example, in being able to identify the impacts of disasters on different communities. Data can be disaggregated to focus on different sectors such as disability, age, gender, ethnicity, location. National statistical officers or NSOs, government departments or agencies that collect, compile and release official national level population data. Organizations of people or persons with disabilities, OPDs, are representative organizations or groups of people with disabilities where most of the overall staff, board and volunteers across all levels are people with disabilities. They represent the interests of their members uh, with disabilities and have the mandate to advocate for the realization of their human rights. They can exist at local, national, regional, and international levels. And finally, monograph. It's a detailed and thoroughly documented written study of a single specialized subject or field of inquiry. Unlike censees or national level data, uh, monographs are incredibly specific uh, and poses a uniform and continuous argument based on original research and analysis, often written by a single author. So with that, we're going to uh, begin. I'll speak briefly to format, actually. So we're going to hear from each person or people for approximately 15 minutes, and then we'll make sure to have at least 30 minutes for questions. So please do keep questions in mind. Now with that, over to you, Herc. Thank you, Connor, and uh, good morning to all. Uh, thank you for coming for this uh, data on uh, disability. Uh, yeah, what you can see in this uh, slide is uh, two documents that the uh, Las Piñas Persons with Disability Federation have uh, documented and produced. Uh, the, the first one on your right is the profiling, uh, which is addressed to the city government, uh, to all its uh, agencies. And the second document, uh, is addressed to the villages, the 20 villages uh, that's comprising the city of Las Piñas. Uh, for this case example, Las Piñas have about 532,000 uh, population, but only 7,221 7, was registered under the ID or registration for persons with disabilities. Uh, but the... Uh, the total that was just encoded because there are uh, forms that are nullified is only 5,877. Now, uh, the questions used uh, for this uh, study is the combination of the Washington short set of questions as well as the questionnaire from the Philippine Registry on persons with disability. So it covers uh, many areas, but they added uh, like the voting population and other information that they think is uh, very important for their uh, federation to cover. Uh, the reason why they uh, conducted this uh, uh, citizen generated data is that there is no updated evidence of the number and situation or status of persons with disabilities in the city of Las Piñas. And second, without data, the city government's programs and services and budgets are not relevant and appropriate to the needs and rights of children and persons with disabilities. And the third is that the federation itself, the Las Piñas Persons with Disability Federation, have no updated data to provide evidence for policy advocacy, program development, and disability inclusive uh, budget, budgeting in the villages and at the city level. Uh, the process released uh, um, all the 
uh, data generators, including those who analyze and encode the data, are from the disability sector. So it, it's either uh, the person with disability themselves or their parents or siblings who were involved in the uh, data generation, uh, including uh, the right shop for the questionnaire. So uh, all of them were involved in the right shop and also the participatory video uh, production because they want to uh, produce a video of all the processes that they have gone through uh, in the data processing. And the process, uh, another process that they, uh, the data encoding analysis, results consolidation and report finalization uh, was uh, done mainly by the uh, Federation and with support from uh, from statisticians from the universities who participated in this uh, uh, data uh, profiling. Uh, the questions involved uh, includes the uh, education, gender, uh, voting population, uh, causes of disability, educational attainment, and including employment status. Uh, we also included the disability data identification because that's the only way that uh, we can identify persons with disabilities that is registered under the Philippine Registry for Persons with Disabilities. Uh, just giving you some sample of the uh, information that we got uh about age so if you look at the data about 18.95 percent are uh, children uh, ages uh, 0 to 17 years old uh, we call minor in the philippines then uh, adults is consists about 74.36 percent and uh, uh, this is further disaggregated according to 80 to 40 years old and 41 to 59 years old with uh, some information on the senior citizens, uh, which is 60 and above. The other data uh, that we gathered is the causes of disability. Uh, so if you look at this uh, figure, 46.7% uh, is caused by illness, then 11.8% uh, injury, and then uh, congenital and genetics. So uh, we're looking at this information because we want the Department of Health to understand uh, the reasons for uh, these kinds of disabilities and uh, make appropriate uh, programs uh, in relation to this uh, information. The other information is about the educational attainment. So uh, if you look at the uh, graph, uh, there are only about 598 uh, who did not attend school, and uh, 1,282 of finished college, and then uh, some 670 is an, are undergraduate. Now, uh, looking at this educational attainment and the next uh, sample information about employment status, uh, even if you finished high school or if you even if you finished college, uh, there's not a possibility that all of you will be able to get a job. Uh, knowing that uh, of the adult population, about 1,187 are unemployed, only 953 are employed, and the others are self-employed. So uh, again, this uh, provides us some information. Why are these people, even if they're uh, graduate of college, uh, are still unemployed? Some of them are unemployable because it's probably of the condition, severe conditions that they have. So uh, the other uh, information is about the status uh, of uh, uh, employment based on gender. Uh, so if you look at the uh, those employed and self-employed, uh, most of these are uh, female, uh, male, and then, of course, uh, those unemployed, uh, mostly female, 642. Uh, then uh, the ones, the information that's not applicable is, uh, uh, are those uh, persons with disabilities interviewed who have uh, been unemployed for uh, most of their 
life, uh, life because of uh, severe disabilities. Okay, uh, the other informa is information is about the types and gender of disability. Uh, so for the types, uh, only the, I think uh, we have rare and uh, rare diseases and cancer, which has been added by the Philippine government as uh, part of the um, uh, other, other uh, uh, types of disability. Uh, because for uh, most of the description or uh, categorization, only about seven or six, but uh, the Philippine government adds uh, cancer and rare disease. So uh, again, uh, most uh, uh, prominent are uh, the physical, uh, those with orthopedic disabilities, and then of course psychosocial, those with psychosocial disabilities, and intellectual. So all this information uh, have been uh, generated uh, for the use of the Las Piñas Persons with Disability Federation uh, to develop their advocacy programs and also influence uh, government departments uh, for their uh, programs and services that are appropriate uh, to this information. Okay, so after that, uh, it was presented uh, to the multi stakeholders so that we'll be able to uh, get their commitments to support uh, the recommendations and findings of uh, the research. So um, on the key impacts uh, of the study, uh, after the uh, presentation, uh, the city and all the 20 village, villages now have disability data uh, that are appropriate and relevant for their programs and uh, budgets. Second is that data can now be migrated to the Philippine Registry for Persons with Disability, making it easier for persons with disabilities to avail and access field health insurance services. Uh, this is because of the universal health care law uh, that uh, requires uh, persons with disabilities to have this ID so that they'll be able to access it. Then uh, third is the in, uh, improved engagement of persons with disabilities in local affairs. So 50% uh, of the of the villages now have set up disability affairs office and some villages have set up persons with disabilities assistance desk. And these are all uh, manned by persons with disabilities. The fourth uh, is that uh, the uh, Las Piñas Federation form partnerships with NGOs and uh, civil society organizations corporate and academy uh, uh, to access services that are not readily available in the city, um, especially to um, Accenture and Concentrix, one of the um, uh, IT technology uh, corporations in the Philippines held an, uh, an employer's forum and also conducted uh, this um, open uh, open uh, access to people with disabilities to access their uh, employment um, opportunities, but uh, sadly, uh, about one one hundred uh, vacancies, only five uh, were uh, taken to uh, the job. Then. Uh, the fifth is that uh, it mobilized 131 persons with disabilities and community volunteers, including parents, relatives, uh, during the data profiling. Then the uh, most significant is that while they have only identified 7,000 uh, persons with disability having IDs, uh, because of the uh, presentation and uh, involvement of the uh, villages, uh, after they get the results. Um, it has now gone to 24,000 persons with disabilities who have availed of the IDs. So which means that there are still other uh, persons with disabilities there that still are uh, going to uh, avail of the IDs because of the uh, insurances. Wrapping up? Okay, 
Yeah, so uh, another key impact is that uh, the Lespinas Federation was invited and has participated in different planning activities of the government, including disaster risk reduction and management, uh, health boards, gender and development planning, including uh, during the annual investment planning, which happens every year. Uh, it started an advocacy on uh, accessible transport to increase employment among persons with disabilities because the problem is that when persons with disabilities goes to uh, their uh, workplaces, they need taxi and that costs a lot. So uh, they are now planning to uh, have this accessible transport uh, developed and available in the city. And then, of course, the uh, Metro Manila Federation Persons with Disabilities, which is composed of 17 big organizations, have requested for training and support in data profiling. And then finally, the uh, National C Council for Disability Affairs uh, has requested CBM and also the Spanish Federation to um, conduct a nationwide uh, citizen-generated data Profiling for persons with disabilities. Uh, so the in, uh, investment impact that is uh, making the issue about persons with disabilities vis invisible to visible. Uh, one is that the awareness and recognition by the city and village uh, chiefs uh, the stat on the status of persons with disabilities, leading to relevant and appropriate programs for services in and increase the budget for the sector. Uh, the second uh, uh, impact is that it has already, uh, Las Piñas Federation has already been recognized and became members of local and city governments bodies. And then the third is the tripled enrollment of, get, of uh, persons with disabilities who are now getting uh, IDs and thus um, availing of the ins uh, health insurance and the Philippine Health Health Insurance Corporation. So uh, I think the investment of about 10, uh, 32,000 euros uh, has been uh, doubled because of the results of this uh, citizen generated data. Uh, these are just the key learnings that the group has uh, put on. Uh, uh, so one is the importance of data in policy making, budgeting, and programming including advocacy. Other uh, learning was about internal, so using of online survey tool, uh, and then availability of gadgets and uh, preparation of enumerators should have been done uh, more thoroughly. And then of course, uh, the success factors that they have identified, one is the leadership and engagement of officers, members, parents and peers of the Las Pinas uh, persons with Disability Federation, including area coordinators and enumerators who have been uh, who have lived experience of disability, and uh, of course the strong partnership with the academy and schools where they were taught to facilitate training and video documentation, data encoding, uh, including uh, training on resources as the city of volunteers. Uh, strong partnership and buy-in of the barangay or chief. Uh, or local uh, government councils and the city LGUs, including homeowners association, or provide other resources. And then disability responsive and accessible facilities were offered to enumerators, including in satellite registration centers. So uh, I think that's all for that uh, study. Thank you. Fantastic. We're going to charge ahead, so we have a great time for questions at the end. So I'm now going to pass on to Seta. Ambula, everybody. Okay, so you can do better there. Ambula, everybody. Okay, um, after an excellent uh, keynote address this morning, followed by by um, uh, the presentation from a uh, good friend from the Philippines, uh, her, uh, the, uh, my, my presentation, and thanks to Kona for doing the slides, 
uh, focusing on, on uh, what the work we've done uh, with Pacific Disability Forum, with uh, member organizations uh, in the region around um, OPD, organizations of person disabilities engagement, and, and, and in data. Um, a slide two, please, Kona. Uh, okay, we we have been doing this work, uh, um, I think for almost a decade, and because we saw the need uh, to identify data or disability statistics to be important in our advocacy work. And a, a critical uh, part of that is building the capacity of uh, organizations of persons with disabilities in disability statistics. Understanding the tools, so the different tools that I use, I'll speak to this a little bit later. Um, and, and so that, that they can advocate on these different tools that are being used. Uh, the limitations of the tools, what they can do and what they cannot do. Uh, and of course, how the data can be used to uh, for advocacy purposes to influence governments and uh, even civil society and, and policy makers. Um, we also uh, uh, saw the need to, uh, to um, strengthen the OPDs to build the, the standard of their convening power. Uh, to demand uh, for, for disaggregated data in particular, uh, because uh, we often ask the question, uh, when, you, when we talk to governments, how many people are we talking about? Um, which also then link to the resourcing of organizations with persons with disabilities, that's critical in this work. Also, uh, the, so the need to build the capacity of the national NSOs, Kwana uh, mentioned earlier, NSOs, National Statistics Office, uh, so that they can do the work they do uh, to better in data collection and the use of the Washington group uh, set of questions in particular. Um, also, uh, uh, CRPD, the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities is um, a key mandate document for us. Uh, all our countries in the Pacific except one have yet to ratify, thanks to Solomon Islands for ratifying a few months ago. Uh, we're hoping that uh, no naming and shaming that Tonga will do uh, soon. Uh, and Article 31 in particular talks about this, this statistics in particular. And uh, when you look at SDG, that would uh, be the topic this morning, uh, goal 17.18, there's a target there specifically for data segregation. Uh, slide three, please, Kona. Uh, it's very important that we collect data to understand also, not just to hunt the numbers but also to understand the barriers that they face. And also essential for, uh, as we've been talking about, to monitor SDGs, how that's fared for persons with disabilities, particularly in the notion, you can go to slide four corner, uh, particularly on the, the notion of leaving no one behind. I said, uh, I think a couple of meetings, uh, some meetings that have been to in other places, you know, MDG did a very bad job of not including persons with disabilities. We were not part of MDG, the Millennium Development Goal. That's probably all well gone by in terms of references, maybe, I'm assuming. And SDGs came, we advocated for, for a change in narrative, for the inclusion of persons with disabilities, um, and, and, and hence the notion of leaving no one behind. But I said, I think, to the leaders meeting, I believe, recently, Cook Islands, this term has become such a, I don't know, political football has become uh, uh, even uh, watered down so much that everybody's claiming to be left behind. And yet we still have these personal disabilities that we are advocating for we would be left further behind. Uh, that's the overview of the session today. Um, let's go to the next slide, please, uh, Corner. In terms of OPD advocacy, as I mentioned earlier, um, Looking at the sustainable development goals and target the 17 goals, I know in the Pacific, uh, we at one point in time, the Pacific look at these sets of what, 300 something indicators, what's relevant for the Pacific. Um, uh, the, the, the target two, target three indicators, those that have uh, data sets, those that don't. And many of the few, several, majority of the indicators relating to persons disabilities struggle to have data sets, data collection uh, uh, system. 
as I said, we've been working on this, particularly I think since 2015, a little earlier, on uh, on emphasizing the the, the focus on uh, on data, the importance of that. I talked about maximizing our convening power, uh, and data is a useful tool for us to advocate for changes in our governments, in our systems. As I said earlier, when we go to government uh, meetings, meet our government ministers, they often tell us how many people we're representing. We know now also, uh, here in the uh, here the WHO has upped the percentage from W from 15% to now 16%. Again, at the leaders' meeting in the Cook Islands uh, a few weeks back. I suggest to them, you know, if it takes 16%, we probably would be talking about close to 2 million first disabilities in the region, given the, the, the population of uh, Pacific Islanders, excluding Australia and New Zealand. So 2 million, when you put all these 2 million in, an, in a country, if they become a country, that's more than Fiji. That's after Papua New Guinea. So we're really talking about a sizable uh, population number that really our governments cannot afford to ignore. And so is development partners. So is us in this room. So using this Western, Western, using the Western group on the short set of the, the questions, uh, and we've advocated, I think, about 10 countries have included the Washington group short set in the, in the questions, in the census questions. And this work, of course, uh, I'm here to, 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 to say about this work, but really it's not our work alone. We were able to do this with the help of our uh, key partners. Some probably are here in this room. Uh, UNICEF and the NSPC, the Secretary of the Pacific Community in particular, um, helping us build our capacity. UNICEF supporting some of our participation in, uh, in, in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in the Washington group training. And it's the whole, the whole process from design to data collection analysis. We need to be part of those processes. Next slide, please, uh, Pona. Are you on slide six? Yes. Yeah, you've, you've heard me referred a few times to the need to be the capacity of OPDs. The numbers are about us, and the nothing without us, or the nothing about us without us, now to nothing without us. It's very important that we are uh, engaging with disabilities and their representative organizations. I talked earlier about understanding the different tools. It's important for them to know. Uh, what are this is what are these different tools that are used by NSOs in data collection? Uh, for example, the short set, six, the six short set of questions for uh, for census. There's a child module uh, for children. We have the extended set, the Washington Group so, uh, extended set for adults. Uh, there's a module inclusive education, uh, the labor force survey. Uh, it's very important that we understand what are these tools for and what uh, and also their limitations and what they do. So that's important for us to be training our OPDs. Uh, not only that OPDs to be trained, but we ourselves, a PDF is an organization, we have key staff uh, underwent training, then they become trained, the trained uh, uh, for OPDs. Uh, of course, when we get the data, then we need to advocate. We have a much more evidence-based, uh, well-informed advocacy messages when we back this up with data. Uh, next slide seven, please, Kona. Um, I talked about strengthening partnership. This is critical for the work that we do. I said that we leave heavy lifting so that I was alone, but together with our partners. Um, uh, the, the, the partnership with the Washington Group, we are PDF, Pacific Disability Forum, is an associate member of the, the Washington Group, so we attend some of their meetings along with NSO. And one of those meetings, I think, here in Sydney, uh, 2012, 2013, that uh, Pacific Group on Disability Statistics, the idea of that was conceived. And uh, now uh, in the, I think you there are probably some stages of uh, this group, Pacific Group on, on Disability Statistics by NSOs, Pacific NSOs, National Stats Officers, together with the uh, Pacific Islands Foreign Secretary, SPC, Regional Office of the Pacific, uh, are part of to make sure that we are collecting data and collecting them well. Uh, I think they need to be persistent, consistent in this space. I think we've saw we were the, the 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 pay of the benefit of engaging this this space almost ten years ago. That our I said, ten countries have now, uh, in a sense, that included the Washington Group. Uh, so it's a question of the six, and so about six of them have gone on to do the disability monogram. Um, 
slide it, please, uh, next slide. Uh, some of the gains made uh, in, in the data advocacy. I yeah, refer to 10 countries that have uh, used the Washington group uh, so set questions, uh, countries like Fiji, Kiribati, and New Air, Nauru, Palau, uh, Samoa, Solomon Islands, uh, Tonga, Tuvalu, and Vanuatu. Um, they've used the, 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 the sensor, the disability monograph, to inform some of their policies. When you think of the Kiribati social protection policy that they now run, um, that benefited from this kind of data. And so is uh, Samoa in, in the social protection teams. We, we are not only advocating for, for the use of the Washington group of uh, questions in the SDG, but, but also looking at the SDGs in the implementation here in the Pacific. Uh, PDF also, um, uh, right now in, in Fiji, they're conducting the employment, the Limpo survey, the, 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 the ILO 17 questions, and a part of that survey I uh, live for serving Fiji right now for uh, up to September, I think next year. And PDF, we train the enumerators how to use this question. Not only they train them, but I think we also paid for some of their work. So we had OPD paying for the work of NSOs, which should have been there anyway. And the, 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 the challenge was that because government has seen there was lack of budget support from government. I think there's also something to take up, take up with Professor Prasad when I go back to Fiji. Mm -hmm. Um, data for SDG reporting. Um, we've used also this data to uh, track SDG uh, implementation in the region. And we've seen uh, some of the key thematic areas like education, employment, um, uh, uh, and other services that are really lagging behind, not excluding for disabilities. Um, and we're also suggesting, we are not arguing, if you heard today uh, from uh, Professor Prasad, Chief, as he said, the Indo-Pacific SDGs targets will not be achieved. If that's the case for ordinary citizens, then what about person disabilities? Uh, slide nine, and it's, uh, my second last slide. Uh, in terms of reflection, you know, this theme of United Action to rescue and achieve the sustainable development goals for, with, and by person disabilities it's a take-home message for us. We have seven years to run, and yet person disabilities continue to be uncounted, continue to be uh, um, fully recorded uh, in terms of their, 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 their exist in some countries. We need to rescue. Uh, seven years is, I think, there's enough opportunity for us to right this wrong, and then to make sure that person disabilities are part of data collection, more importantly, the translation of those information to policy, uh, budgets, legislation at national and uh, regional level. Um, you talked about the struggle that the Pacific will have in, in, sustain, in meeting its uh, SDG goals and targets. Um, so therefore, the stronger need for us to use data to find out the gaps. Where are those gaps still? Uh, where are those gaps uh, still exist in these SDG goals? and how we can improve on them in terms of at least moving, moving the dial a little bit towards um, those negative person disabilities. Uh, next slide 10. Um, the, 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 there's few messages that I want to leave with you. Uh, one is of course uh, resourcing. Uh, we can continue to resource and to and sustain this work uh, to benefit the countries, uh, the NSOs, the countries, the region, uh, capacity building, ongoing training, not just for the OPDs, but also for the uh, national stats officers uh, and the continuing engagement with them, the NSOs, that's very important. Um, the enables participation, there's still a lack, of, lack of data to identify those. That's why when you have uh, the, the, the monograph report, identifying the barriers we can then address what's preventing them from participating in those activities. Um, and of course, data too is very important to show uh, how this build, this build inclusion has, uh, is happening. And of course, what are the gaps so that we can improve not just inclusion, but also equity in this space. Um, I thank you. Uh, 
Fantastic. You're bang on time, Seto. Appreciate it. Thank you, Seto. We'll now move uh, to our online presenters with Sophie Mitra and Michael Palmer of the Data Disability Data Initiative. Hi, everyone. Is the sound okay? We can hear you well. Thank you, Sophie. Okay, very good. Uh, so let me share my screen. Okay, so my name is Sophie Mitra. I'm, an, I'm a middle-aged uh, white woman with uh, gray hair. Um, and I'm going to uh, present with uh, Maikon um, some results from the Disability Init Data Initiative and how it can our results can help uh, fill some of the gaps in knowledge that we need uh, on inequalities that persons with disabilities face. Um, so as a little bit of background, disability is remarkably common. We've had increasing evidence around the world that prevalence rates um, are, are high in the sense that one in six adults around the world uh, has a disability and one in 10 children worldwide. So what do we mean by disability? So in, uh, in this presentation, we we'll use the term disability as... Um, as an interactional and human rights uh, notion, meaning that disability results from the interaction of a person with a health condition or an impairment uh, with their uh, environment. And, um, and persons with disabilities, uh, so in the human rights model, are participants in society and, um, and the economy and uh, as well as citizens. So we, do, we we, in this context, we focus on the environmental barriers as well as the resources, the limitation in resources that people with disabilities might, uh, might face. Um, so to switch to data, um, in household surveys and censuses, uh, disability has, uh, has been measured in different ways, uh, but recently there has been increasing evidence uh, and, and studies to show that we can measure disability through questions uh, asking people whether they experience difficulties uh, in different functional domains. So for instance, asking people if they experience difficulty seeing even where, uh, when wearing glasses or difficulty hearing. Um, so um, thanks to the work of the Washington group, we have a, a set of uh, questions that uh, can be used in different country contexts. Um, disability, uh, with, with such data on functional difficulties, we've had uh, a lot of um, studies showing how disability is associated with socioeconomic disadvantage, uh, such as low educational attainment, low literacy rates, uh, low employment rates, uh, as well as multidimensional poverty, meaning deprivations in uh, multiple domains. Um, producing national and subnational statistics on the situation of persons with disabilities is very important. Uh, it's very important to monitor the implementations of the Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as well as the uh, Sustainable uh, Development Goals. And it's important for policy at national as well as um, subnational levels, so like municip for municipalities. But yet there is a lack of information on uh, the inequalities that persons with disabilities face and, uh, and statistics are not often produced to document uh, inequalities. Uh, so the mission of the Disability Data Initiative is to uh, provide uh, analysis of disability data to advance the rights of persons with disabilities and sustainable human development for all. So we've been producing reports since 2021, and each report uh, does two things. First, it maps the availability of internationally comparable disability data across the world. So meaning, when are when do we have functional difficulty questions, such as the ones I mentioned before, the difficulty seeing, difficulty hearing, and so on. So we systematically review uh, data sets and their disability questions and document the availability of, 
of um, the the questions in the in the surveys or in the censuses. And second, we produce for some countries when we have adequate data, uh, so surveys or censuses with functional difficulty questions, we produce disability disaggregated indicators as well as prevalence rates as at both national and subnational levels. Uh, so here is the website, uh, https column forward slash forward slash disability data dot ace.fordham.edu forward slash. So for the first um, aim of the report to review censuses and, and surveys uh, questionnaires, uh, so in the 23 report, we presented results of a review of uh, close to 1300 uh, data sets. Uh, from 188 countries and territories. We screened their disability questions. And we found that two thirds of countries have functional difficulty questions in their surveys or censuses. Um, now, it doesn't mean that a country is going to have those questions available in all of the data sets. Uh, often we found countries collected uh, in, introduced um, the disability questions in one data set, but not in others. So overall, only one in five data sets uh, that were reviewed. So uh, one in five of the 1300 data sets also had functional difficulty questions. So there is a lot more work to do in terms of including functional difficulty questions in surveys and censuses around the world. So this is this map, this is a map of the world that shows our result in terms of finding the um, functional difficulty questions um, in the different countries uh, that we reviewed. So the darkest uh, red is for countries where we found surveys or censuses with the Washington Group short set. And then the, the bright red is when we found other functional difficulty questions and uh, light red is when we did not find uh, functional difficulty questions at all. So overall, you see that a lot of countries do have data sets with functional difficulty questions, and that's particularly the case in Sub-Saharan Africa, um, in North America, also in, in the Pacific. Um, now, over time, we see an increase in the uh, share, the proportion of data sets that have functional difficulty questions globally and by region. So this is what th this uh, chart illustrates. So it shows from 2010 until 2022, the proportion of data sets with the functional difficulty uh, questions uh, globally and then for each region of the world. So there, there is a lot of heterogeneity across regions. Um, I mean, overall, globally, we see an increase. More and more data sets do include functional difficulty questions. And um, we see the sharpest increase um, in, um, I mean, recently in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, but also some very sharp increases in the Middle East and uh, North Africa. For um, for East Asia and the Pacific, there has been uh, there also has been a sharp increase since 2010. It slowed down a little bit uh, in the early 2020s, uh, but it's still early to um, talk about what's going on in the 2020s because a lot of countries put on hold their data collection during the pandemic. All right, so now I'll pass it over to Michael for the disability disaggregated uh, statistics. Great, thanks uh, Thanks very much, Sophie. Good morning, everyone. Um, still quite early here in Perth. Um, it's a great pleasure to be here representing the DDI and I'll um, just talk briefly about um, some of our results. Um, it'll be a global sort of snapshot with a um, and I'll try and focus the discussion on on countries in our in our region. So, as Sophie mentioned, the um, I guess one of the main aims of the initiative is to 
uh, generate information on disability prevalence and also to document the extent of inequality by disability status. Um, so typically what we do in our reports is that we, um, we document uh, disability prevalence at the national level. So most of the, pretty much all the surveys that we work with um, are representative at the national level. Um, so we generate statistics on um, disability prevalence using the Washington Group um, question set primarily. Um, and that enables us also to, um, is everyone following me here, Sophie? Great, thanks. Um, so what we can do is we can document the extent of disability prevalence by the um, severity of disability. So we can, um, uh, we can document um, severe disability defined according to people that have a lot of difficulty or cannot do in any of the domains. Um, we can also you know, generate information on sort of mild or moderate level of disability um, for those people that report some level of difficulty. Um, and we classify people without disabilities as those that report um, no difficulty in any of the domains. Um, so in addition to that, we um, document inequality across um, a range of different indicators. So life areas, including education, employment, um, health status, poverty. Um, so I'll go through some of the results today. Um, and then we, dis we can disaggregate even further according to um, characteristics of people such as gender, whether they live in a rural or urban residence and also by age. So for example, we might look at the employment rates for men and women with disabilities compared to those without disabilities. Okay, so we have um, generated um, inequality information for more than 70 countries. Um, and looking here, we can see the prevalence rates um, of functional difficulty across different countries around the world. And as we can see quite clearly, there's a lot of variation. So reported um, disability prevalence ranges from around 12% to, um, you know, 20, you know, 25% in, in some countries. Um, and we can see here that the the reported um, rate of disability also varies according to the level of um, severity. So people that report to have um, a lot of difficulty in these functional domains are uh, represented by the red and white. Um, and we can see that even though there is variation across countries, um, the, the extent of people that report to have severe functional difficulty is relatively consistent across countries. Whereas a lot of the variation in reported disability prevalence is coming from people that report some degree of difficulty. Um, so we can see, for example, in our region, Cambodia and Tonga have similar disability prevalence rates on the left of the screen at around sort of, you know, 12, 13%. And we can see in, in Tonga that the proportion of people reporting um, more severe disabilities is higher than in Cambodia, for example. Um, and looking at Timor-Leste further along um, to the middle of the screen, we can see that there's much higher rates of disability prevalence around 20%, and the vast majority of these people uh, report to have some degree of difficulty. If you can just move on, thanks, Sophie. Um, we don't have time today to go through the results, but we also tend to um, report prevalence according to the um, uh, the domain of disability, so whether people report seeing, hearing, mobility, cognition, self-care or communication um, difficulties. Um, and what we commonly observe across countries is that seeing and mobility difficulties um, are, are most prevalent. Um, and we also find consistent patterns across um, uh, the population according to demographic characteristics. So we tend to see higher rates of disability reported um, among women compared to men, and also among older people. Um, and one reason for this potentially that we see higher rates among women is that women tend to live longer and we see a strong correlation between disability and age. Okay, so in the graph here, we, we're looking at um, the rate um, um, that people report to have ever attended school. So that's any level of schooling. Um, and we can see here that the, the top of the, um, 
the, the height of each bar given by the light blue represents the rate of ever attending school for people with uh, no reported disability. Um, and the sort of lighter blue represent different degrees of disability um, severity. So what we can see clearly across countries is that the rate of ever, ever attending school is, is, is higher for people without disability than those with disability. Um, so there's you know, quite significant gaps um, across countries. Um, um, just looking at um, Timor-Leste, which is a quite extreme example. So sort of towards the left of the screen, um, we can see that around 75% of the population without disability report to have ever attended school, um, whereas only around, you know, just over 20% of people with severe disabilities have attended school, around 45% of people with um, less severe disabilities have attended school. Um, in Papua New Guinea, just to the right there, we have sort of similar patterns, um, although they seem to be doing slightly better here, where the overall um, rate of school attendance for the non-disabled population is similar, around 75%. Um, but again, we see quite substantial gaps um, among people with severe disabilities. So we can see that the reported school attendance rate is just over 40% for people with severe disabilities. So what we're seeing across a lot of countries is this sort of consistent gap of around 20 to 30 percentage points. Um, even in a country like Vietnam, in the right of the screen here, we have you know, much higher rates of school attendance um, across the population. So over 90% for people without disabilities. However, those people that report a severe disability um, you know, have attendance rates of around 65%. So again, we're seeing a gap of around 30 percentage points. Thanks, Sophie, we'll just move on. So here we're looking at um, rates of multidimensional poverty. So this is a measure that captures sort of uh, broader dimensions of deprivation beyond just um, sort of income or consumption-based measures of poverty. So our measure of multidimensional poverty here includes deprivation across four key areas. So schooling, um, 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 work, um, health and also living standards. So we have a number of, I think we have over 12 deprivation indicators. So one would be people that report to have less than primary school, uh, primary school education, people that report not to be working in any form of paid or unpaid work, people that live in housing without um, quality or safe water and sanitation, um, uh, people that have a low, people that live in, in households that have a low um, threshold of assets, for example. So this is a, an aggregated index um, of, of deprivation across these um, various dimensions of health, education, work and living standards. And what we can see um, as expected is that we see that um, people with disabilities that uh, particularly those with severe levels of disability that are represented by the, um, uh, the light blue here um, have significantly higher rates of multidimensional poverty, and that's consistent across all countries that we've surveyed. Um, so we can see rates um, close to 100% um, for this population. Um, and we see gaps, of course, um, um, between um, uh, those people that uh, don't report to have any functional difficulty. I think what's interesting to note here is that- Michael, um, we've just got a couple of minutes, if that's okay. Yep, sure, I'm just finishing up, thanks. What's interesting to note here is that um, in countries like Timor-Leste and um, Papua New Guinea, we have higher rates of multidimensional poverty across the population, but the gaps between disabled and non-disabled are quite small. Whereas if we look to the right of the screen, we look at countries like Vietnam and Indonesia, we have much lower rates of multidimensional poverty um, uh, particularly amongst the non-disabled population, so less than 20%. But for the disabled population, particularly the severely disabled population, we still see very high rates of multidimensional poverty over you know, 60%. So the, the gaps are actually higher in sort of, I guess, um, more developed countries. Um, and that sort of speaks to what you know, um, the earlier speakers were talking about in terms of you know, this population being, being left behind in the process of development. Okay, so I'll just move on. 
what we can see here is we're looking at multidimensional poverty within a country, so looking at East Timor. Um, and what's interesting to observe is that um, for people that report to have no disability, that there's a lot of variation in the poverty rate um, across different regions in, in East Timor. But when we focus on the population that report disability, we can see that there's much less variation across um, different regions within the country. And that's even more the case for people that report to have a lot of functional difficulty. Okay, moving on, thanks. Okay, so in summary, uh, what we see consistently across countries is that we see significant gaps or inequalities by disability status um, across um, key sort of indicators such as educational attainment, uh, multidimensional poverty, and that those gaps tend to be higher according to the level of functional difficulty. And we also see that these results hold within countries. So there's not a lot of difference across regions or districts within a country. Thank you. I'll just now pass over to Sophie. And just to conclude briefly, um... So we, um, we found that um, disability data was increasingly available across surveys and censuses around the world, but more is needed in terms of data collection. Uh, and, the, and we recommend that governments and international organizations allocate more resources towards disability data analysis, because when the data is collected, uh, often it's not uh, analyzed. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I appreciate the um, uh, kindness in response to my hustling you along. So thank you. It's a significant volume of work and I recognize the impost that it is to try and summarize not only the work, but the findings in such short um, terms. So thank you, Sophia Michael. We're now gonna move into our question and answer session. And we have um, a little under half an hour for that. Uh, I am going to, um, ask that when you, we have some mics roaming around, but when you uh, ask a question, please briefly introduce yourself by saying your name, your organization, and giving a brief visual description. But first, I'm going to take uh, moderator's privilege and get us going with a question for uh, each of the panel to respond to briefly. Um, as Seta mentioned, the theme for International Day of People with Disabilities, which occurred on Sunday just gone, this year was United in Action to Rescue and Achieve the Sustainable Development Goals for, with and by persons with disabilities. So as we know, 2024 will be a big year for the SDGs and Agenda 2030, both in terms of review, but also starting to lay the groundwork for what might come beyond 2030. So my question for each of the panel to respond to briefly to get us started with Q&A is, what is one key data-related intervention, in your view, that would unlock progress for people with disabilities on Agenda 2030? I'll go first to uh, Seta, and then we'll hear from Herc, and then Sophie or Michael from DDI. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, to, to me, the, um, the experience that, I, that, uh, that I, uh, we had in Fiji, which I referred to the Bureau of Stats, and that them not having the resource there is money, the, the funding, to uh, to uh, include uh, disability um, indicators targets in the in, in the um, um, labor force survey. So the the key the key uh, in component for uh, for NSOs to do what they should do is to allocate resources, and uh, for them to to get the resources, it needs to come from government. And for the government to allocate resources, they need to prioritize it. So I think it's a chain of a sequence of events that I think that starts with government to allocate sufficient resources to do this work. Thank you. Uh, my take about the question is that uh, uh, there's not one uh, specific data intervention, but uh, uh, to uh, to break the cycle of poverty and disability, you need to have this uh, the barrier to have the research on the barriers to health and other support services, the barriers to education, and uh, the barriers to access to economic opportunities of persons with disabilities. Because based on the result I have presented, while uh, they have been they have access to education, but then employment is also a problem. So there might be some 
type of uh, discrimination in the uh, access to economic and employment opportunities. Great, I might just stick it and over to Sophia Michael. Yes, uh, no, thank you for this great question. Um, I, I would say, um, well, we need to continue to advocate for more data collection as well as um, data analysis. So data collection in national data sets by NSOs, but also in uh, various development projects um, that um, we, we need to know if the development projects are working for everyone, including people with disabilities. So we know how to collect data on disability and we, um, we should systematically collect the data and analyze it uh, and disaggregate indicators um, for all interventions in development. Thank you very much. Over to, to you, uh, who's got a question? In the black top. Um, hi, my name's Lydia. I'm from DT Global Australia. I'm a 39 year old white woman wearing a black top and I'm a little bit nervous, so thank you. Um, I was just wondering if there's any data or good data on the economic outcomes that can be linked to the inclusion of people with a disability um, that ties in with the standard data collection sets. Um, obviously, it would be really great to be able to demonstrate to governments that there, there is strong economic outcomes um, and to be able to sort of align that with the data. So I'm just wondering if that's something that exists. Thank you. Great question. I think in the first instance, I might go to our colleagues at DDI on a response on that one. Uh, Michael, do you want to go ahead? Or? Uh, I can, yeah, sure. Um, great, thank you for the question. Um, I think, I mean, the answer is yes. I mean, there's a lot of information in these surveys on indicators like employment, um, um, poverty that we we just spoke about in the presentation. We didn't present the results in terms of employment, but that's obviously a key economic indicator. Um, you know, it depends upon the survey, but you know, surveys also have information on income or consumption expenditure, which is a measure of living standards. Um, we presented today results on multidimensional poverty, which is a I guess a broader um, measure of well-being or economic well-being. Um, so I think, yeah, most certainly there's there's a lot of information. As Sophie was saying, it's just a, a question, I guess, of disaggregating that data and, and analyzing it um, and and um, uh, including it in, in, in any reports. Um, obviously, economic indicators are important. So um, I think the answer is definitely yes. Sophie, do you want to add anything further to that? Uh, no, thank you. But maybe obviously education, lots of educational outcomes are also available, but yeah. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. And we'll go to the gentleman in the blue. Uh, my name is Dinar, I'm from Indonesia. Um, I'm a Southeast Asian looking man and with black hair, blue shirt and uh, glasses. Uh, I'm from uh, DT Global Indonesia. And currently, uh, my team providing like a technical support for the government of Indonesia to establish like a disability, national disability data. And uh, we've been looking up into the Philippines because uh, it has a lot of like an advanced programs uh, from the concessions to the national data. So I I am really interested with the initiatives uh, in in the last Pina city, but my question is what I understand the Philippine government already has this uh, national disability prevalence uh, survey or NDPS, and also like a disability assessment uh, to issue the uh, national uh, or Philippines ID card disability ID card. So my question would be. Um, uh, how this last pinast initiative are uh, different with these two mechanisms, two existing mechanisms, uh, in terms of the methodology and also in terms of the scope of information that is collected. 
So thank you. Uh, thank you for that uh, information. Yes, we have uh, several data about uh, persons with disabilities. Uh, I think the latest was the 2020 household survey, uh, which uh, resulted to an 8.7 percent of uh, those uh, 110 million people uh, surveyed. Uh, the 8.7 percent uh, are those with uh, the uh, six functional difficulties, and uh, that's about 8.5 percent, uh, 8.5 million uh, out of the total population. Uh, the other uh, survey was uh, uh, the Philippine Registry for uh, Persons with Disabilities, uh, but the uh, turnout was just, uh, the total was just about 1.5 million uh, was registered. And that's because of the requirements where you need to have medical, um, you have to have a medical endorsement or assessment from uh, medical personnel like uh, uh, developmental psychologists and others, of, uh, 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 you have to pay uh, for these assessments. And uh, poor uh, families with disabilities cannot afford that. So therefore, the difference between 8.7 million of the household survey versus the Philippine National Registry of 1.5. Uh, and that's because of the barriers in uh, getting those uh, medical uh, resources. So I think the the one different from Las Piñas is that they were the ones who identified what type of information they needed for them to use this for advocacy and program development. And so it's more expansive compared to the uh, uh, functional assessments done by the Philippine Statistics Authority and also uh, using the medical uh, medical perspective to uh, identify identify you as a person with disability. So I think uh, it depends on the uh, the purpose of uh, getting data. Uh, but for Las Piñas, they wanted it for advocacy and program and budget uh, purposes. Thank you, Herc. Can I can I just add something further to to that? that oh, please, sure thing, Michael. Um, yeah, also, I mean, just I think it's a great question because, I mean, what we see in national surveys is typically we don't have information on um, people with disabilities certified by the government. So whether that's through a, a card, as you mentioned, or whether it's through, um, you know, eligibility to a disability pension. So, um, I mean, that's a problem in terms of thinking about the targeting. So, um, you know, I guess that's some, something that we could also... Um, a message that we could deliver today as well is that you know it would be great to be including that information in in household surveys you know so not just having information on self-reported disability but also having information collected on whether people are receiving um, disability benefits from the government great thank you michael uh hi it's sarah dyer here from strategic development group i'm an older white woman with white hair and multi-color top today um, thanks to all the presenters. It was really fascinating. And I think it's good to sit back and reflect on the progress that's been made um, in, in improving what is still an area where there's an amazing gap and need. I guess my question goes to where we're starting to see the strength of evidence and the support of adv advocacy and then moving it into evidence-based policy and program influencing. Perhaps what stands out is in the area of social protection particularly. And I guess my question to the panel is really, what else needs to happen to take it that step forward, further forward? I mean, we, you know, the nothing about us without us, the leadership and, you know, really, really um, people leading the process. And I guess I look at it from the side of whether it's like the work in the Philippines with at local government and national government level to get the changes happening or in development assistance, whether it's the development partners or people like myself, our company works in facilitating designs and evaluations what needs to happen at a perhaps a more structural level or perhaps you know take us a bit further to enable that there's more meaningful and easier contribution participation and real informing by on on the this disability data and being led by um people with disabilities who who have this information and experience yeah thank you thanks sarah i'll go to seta
No, that, that's a tough question, uh, Sarah. Um, uh, but 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 it's it's a, a needed one, and I think a, a timely one as well. Uh, uh, for uh, if I could in, in the Pacific at least, or even in the Indo Pacific, when it comes to uh, the Australian um, policy, uh, development policy on disability, uh, that they were two, and now we currently our Australian government is currently developing its third. Um, the work that we have done over the years, so. The changes are beginning to to be seen, to be happening. But for for data, for example, the ten countries have included the Washington Group in the in the in the, in the census. Um, but what does it actually that what does that mean? I think at the end of the day, at the end of the day, uh, the children need to be going to school. They need to be at school. Uh, the 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 families need to be supported. A person with disability need, need to be supported so that they can get gainful employment. So I think we probably need to you know, shift the dial more uh, toward, towards the 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 day to day of the real stuff that really matters. That really matters. Um, how how's the enrollment? The enrollment. We talk about junior school. How are they accessing the enrollment? How flexible are the enrollment procedures? And for that to affect the numbers of children with disability at school. Then how accessible are those schools? Are inclusive or inclusive? How, how inclusive is inclusive education? So I, I think it's um, we need probably this way to transform the systems, and and I'm not sure whether disability is suffering from uh, whether overdrive, whether there's a lethargy in 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 the appetite to 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 uh, to uh, towards really meaningful disability inclusion, and that's why I like the 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 the, the narrative around. Disability equity, because there is that's addressing the tough question: what can we do? Must what must we do to have children with disabilities at school for them to be working? I think we need to the dial needs to be shifted to one of equity rather than just about inclusion, not just about warming seats. We need to see the numbers in school. We need to see more people with disability employed. We need to see more people with disabilities in pol in politics. I think I think that's the the game is to, the narrative of that game is to be. To, to change, and I think that has to be a all, 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 uh, all in, encompassing work at at all levels, uh, governments, national, local. Again, example by 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 Philippines, but even also with development partners, or managing contractors that are here. Now the systems are talking to each other, and I am just being to feel that the gloss, the shine, is kind of kind of come up a little bit on on disability inclusion. That's why equity is really important. Thank you. I think. Thank you, Seta. We're running short on time, so I'm going to go to another question. Um, just the lady in the front. Can I just say something briefly on that? Because I think it's really important. Sure thing, I Michael. Think, I think governments are not targeting the eligible population very well. So like we just saw today that around 5% of the population have severe disabilities, as reported by the Washington Group questionnaire. But what we see in a lot of countries in the region is around 1% or less than 1% of the population are receiving disability benefits. So I think that the big need for us going forward is for governments to develop tools that can identify the eligible population with disabilities. And that's very challenging. I mean, disability is complex. It's very hard to classify. There's a lot of classification error, but typically a lot of countries in the region don't have any sort of tools to, to identify people that are most in need of government assistance or non-government assistance. So um, I feel that's a, a massive need for us going forward is to develop tools so that we can identify people that are, that are eligible for um, social protection. Thank you, hey, good morning. My name is Monica. I'm from Cambodia Disabled People Organization. I am in uh, physical impairment. So thank you very much for the speaker to, you know, sharing the finding. I think it's very important. Uh, my first question is not far from Siri regarding to the finding and regarding to the need of people with disability from the research. Because in keep in my mind, because when we say about disability inclusion, my mind is uh, thinking about the accessibility. So the, the most uh, the, the most point that I consider is at uh, this point, how to make it abroad for diversity of people with disability and aware with all stakeholders. This is the number one. And number two, how to, you know, uh, uh, connecting with the uh, government because uh, uh, based on my experience in the previous and until now, 
the government side, if we don't have any policy level that state about the two twin touch approach, like the mainstreaming and a specific activity, it seems nothing happened. Yeah, uh, just only uh, documentation. So I, I also want to learn from the speaker what is uh, you know the province from each country, from the Fiji and from the Philippines. And just want to let you know that for Cambodia now we have uh, launching the disability ID card. So it linking to the you know data uh, disability data. And want to know also uh, linking with the social protection that Sarah has mentioned. And also one thing regarding to public uh, awareness, because what I'm, I'm, I'm thinking regarding to the make the recommendation and the research, research from the evidence make it allowed to all the public. So regarding to the research brief or research funding, what do you have any experience to make it abroad? To, uh, to all those audience they are aware on disability inclusion because disability inclusion is a cutting issue. So everything is over there. That's why we need to aware with the all stakeholders. And thank you very much for the speaker, Sir uh, Seta, to mention about the involvement of OPD in the local area is very important because all of them, they know where regarding to the disability, you know, issue based on the need and they are all living with the, you know, the, that situation. Yes, it is from my point. Thank you. Thanks, Monica. Um, big questions in there, I think, and big challenges, not least related to accessibility, to that critical point about utilisation, which I know was a big uh, topic of the data festival held recently by the Global Partnership on Development Data, which is around not just having the data, but using the data. Um, that's really important, as well as data transparency and sharing. We've got a couple of minutes uh, before we close. I wonder if any of the panel want to pick up a particular point from uh, Monica's, um, what Monica put forward. Uh, for uh, for the Philippines, there was already the Magna Carta for so for uh, persons with disabilities uh, even before the UNCRPD, but that's not uh, uh, CRPD based uh, Magna Carta. But it provided policy for us to really demand uh, programs and services and budgets uh, from the government um, on the issue about. Um, uh, budget um, from uh, from our experience with Las Piñas Federation is that you uh, you have to prove that uh, this particular uh, exercise is really worth it, and so now um, the uh, seventeen federations at the national capital region would like to uh, raise money from their government and from other sources so that they will be able to uh, get that two point five million that they. Uh, a need to have those data. Uh, but uh, I think that is a very big uh, problem for persons with disabilities if they can, if they will uh, shoulder the the, um, the cost of that uh, themselves. No? But the private sector is ready to help. And uh, you see the multi-sector uh, partnership that they've uh, created. So it's really helped a lot and that will uh, provide them more uh, resources not to conduct um, this uh, disability disaggregated data. Thanks, Herc and Monica. I think there's much more we can discuss offline in relation to some of those important points. We've got two minutes remaining, and I just want to, again, uh, take the privilege of the chair by um, asking each of our panellists to give us a brief remark on what the key message is that you want people to take with them as they leave this session. Um, so first we'll go to uh, uh, Sophie or Michael, and then we'll go to Herc and then Seta. In a couple of words, what's the key message you want people to leave today with? No, I, I'll, maybe I'll repeat myself, but I'll say that we still need to uh, do uh, allocate re more resources for data collection and uh, data analysis. So advocacy around that is very important and that we all have a role to play, even if you know, if we're not working on a disability project, if you're working on a development project, let's say on water and sanitation, there's a lot to do in terms of uh, evaluating projects in ways that are going to be inclusive and reflecting the diversity of the, the people who are participating in your project, including on uh, in terms of uh, disability. Thank you. Thanks, Sophie. Herc. 
Uh, from the experience of Las Piñas, I think disability data, uh, disaggregated, is really a game changer. Uh, it makes the invisible issue about persons with disabilities, their rights and their needs more visible to the public. And that created a steer and also increasing resources towards the... So I think uh, it's very important that disability data is uh, uh, generated. And as far as we are also looking at the SDGs in the next seven years, so with disability data in the uh, policy making bodies and putting in budgets out of that, uh, I think that's a game changer. Thank you. And finally, Seto. Yeah, my, mine would be uh, um, after we collect disability data of the analysis, we need to give that data a, a human face, if you like. What do they actually, what do those numbers represent? And yeah, I mean, yeah, I mean for Fiji, 13.7% in the last census are persons with disabilities. And when the government spending is only 0.01% or 0.1% of the budget that benefiting disability, I think there's something wrong with that picture. So let's give that data, disability data, a human face, the humans behind those numbers. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're at time. So I want to thank our esteemed panel for joining us in the room from New York and from Perth. I want to thank our interpreters. Thank you very much for the support and also to you for your participation today. Thank you very much. Thanks. Thanks a lot. <laughs>